Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isretel here for Renaissance Periodization and Juggernaut Training Systems. Video for you today about mesocycle design for hypertrophy, how to build a training program to get the most muscle growth that you can. Just a super basic quick video. We have a series of steps, oh, just about five steps for you to go through and design a logical hypertrophy program. Step number one, and these can go in a variety of orders. I've probably put them in the most convenient order for you, but that's up for debate. Step number one is to pick a frequency for each muscle group that you're gonna train. A little bit arbitrary because a lot of frequencies work really well, and you can always change frequencies later based on recovery timelines and different muscle groups, but generally speaking, any muscle group that you choose to train, you can train between two times a week and six times a week, and you generally get very comparable results. Later on, as the program evolves, as you see how muscles heal and how the responses are, you can always change your frequency. I would shoot for the middle of that range most times or on the low end of the range. So if you're not sure about a muscle group, two to four times a week is a good idea. You can always up your frequency later. So once you pick your frequency, then you say, okay, on Monday I'm training chest and on Thursday I'm training chest, for example. Then it's part two. You want to pepper in the actual training days with exercises because you can't train without knowing what exercises you're going to do. How do you choose the exercises you want? Well, there's always specificity, of course, but that's really simple. When you're training chest, you choose chest exercises, right? It's not rocket science. But people ask the question of, well, what kind of chest exercises are some better than others? And the answer is yes, some are better than others, but it's really highly individual the way you can tell more or less which ones are better for you or which ones have the best SFR, the stimulus to fatigue ratio. What the heck, how do you calculate that? Well, it's really straightforward. You basically choose exercises that you have a couple of things going for them. You have a great mind-muscle connection or better than average. Like when you do, let's say, incline barbell press, not so sure what's happening with your pecs, but if you do incline dumbbell press, you can really feel your pecs working. That's probably a good thing, so check mark on that. Can you feel tension in the target muscle? So sometimes the mind-muscle connection is good, where you can feel the muscle contracting, but it's not a ton of tension throughput that you're really not smashing. So on an incline dumbbell press, you might feel your pecs working, but it might be a situation where, you know, uh, if you do a barbell press, your pecs really have a ton of tension through them, and even though you can feel a lot of other muscles working, the tension is what actually makes your muscles grow, so it's important to not just go for feeler exercises, but also pretty disruptive ones. And lastly, how many sets does it take to get you a good pump? For example, if you're on leg extensions, and five sets later you barely feel a thing, maybe it's not the best exercise for you, but if you do high bar squats, and after two sets your quads are pumped to the bone, maybe that's a good thing. So those are the good check marks, and then that's the stimulus part. These are proxies for stimulus. If you have all these things checked, it's probably a pretty effective exercise as far as causing muscle growth. But also, what about fatigue, right? Those are negatives and they have to be traded off as downsides. So for example, how much joint discomfort do you have in an exercise? Like incline barbell press might just smash your pecs in the best way possible, but gee, they really do mess with your shoulder joints. Whereas the incline dumbbell press might be super easy on your shoulder joints. And even though it might not give you as great of a chest workout, it's more sustainable because it doesn't hurt your joints as much. And of course, there's the question of systemic fatigue. For example, if you do high bar squats, you hit your quads, because you're super upright, you know, it doesn't involve your back a whole lot, and the range of motion is really big, you might hit your quads a lot, and the rest of your body, the rest of the system, it doesn't fatigue a ton. If you do low bar squats, you involve your back more, your glutes more, you can lift more weight. The quads proportionally work just about as much, so the stimulus is similar for the quads, but because you're using more weight, you're using more of a lean in your back, the systemic burden is huge, and you don't just walk away from low bar squats like you do high bar, so maybe, Low bar squats aren't the best for hypertrophy, and that's probably true for most people, even in this example, but more generally, you wanna pick exercises that give you a great stimulus, not a ton of fatigue to go with it. After that, you got your exercises, you know your frequency, you wanna select your training loads. The good news is anything between about a five rep max and a 30 rep max is totally fine. I recommend doing a diversity of rep ranges throughout the week. Some lifts in the five to 10 rep range, some in the 10 to 20, some in the 20 to 30. And eventually, as you gain experience, you'll learn which muscle groups uh, have the best stimulus to fatigue ratios for what rep range. You know, leg extensions for sets of eight might not feel great, might actually hurt your joints more than hit your quads, but in sets of 20 to 30, they might be best. The opposite might be the case for squats and so on and so forth. So now you've selected your loads, 
what you do is you begin your first week's mesocycle or your first microcycle uh, at roughly three or four reps in reserve because that's tough enough to cause hypertrophy, especially for a new series of exercises and rep ranges, but not so close to failure that it ends up fatiguing you a ton and doesn't let your uh, mesocycle run for too much longer. And of course, once you start your mesocycle, you track performance, pumps, soreness, and difficulty. Why? We'll talk about that in the next video we do about how to progress. Now, the last question is, how much volume do we do in our first week? In your first week, you really want to aim for close to what's called your minimum effective volume. That's something that gives you a relatively small pump, gives you a sense that you've worked pretty hard but not too hard, and hopefully gives you either no soreness the day or two after or mild soreness, right? So if you are doing a workout in the gym, you know your exercise, you know your loads, do as many sets as it takes to get a mild pump and like a sense like, okay, I worked a little bit, nothing too crazy. Because if you train too hard in your first week, you could hamper yourself with accumulated fatigue later. And actually, if you cause enough muscle damage in the first week, it can cause you growth, cost you growth right in there in the first week. So now you have everything set up, your whole plan is set up, you've done your first week, what do you do in your second week? We've got that covered in the next video and I'll see you guys then.